the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests today are author, teacher, Lama Surya Das, and actress, singer, producer, Carol Wells Doheny. Author, lecturer, poet, and chant master, Lama Surya Das has spent more than 35 years studying Zen, yoga, and Tibetan Buddhism with the great spiritual masters of Asia. He grew up in Long Island, New York, lettered in high school sports, and went on to graduate summa cum laude with a degree in creative education. Did you intend to teach school when you finished? No, not at all. I thought I would write or something like that. And so, but you weren't going to use your sports? Well, I'm into sports. I'm still into sports. But, but you weren't going to go any professional no, or no. follow through anywhere? No, I wasn't good enough. I mean, you really have to be a... <laughs> you know, an Olympic athlete to be serious about that. But I was interested in writing and changing the world at that time. I was in oh, the yeah. peace movement in the 60s uh -huh. and so forth. So I thought that writing and speaking out and activism was the way to make a difference in the world. But were you a religious? Um, no. As a teenager? No, were not at all. In Judaism? Yes. You were in Judaism yeah. as a religion, right? Yeah. You know, I grew up in Long Island, and I'm Jewish on my parents' side, and I got by mitzvah, but I was never very interested, and nobody could ever answer my questions. So uh, I saw it elsewhere. So did you find a similarity between Buddhism and Judaism? Well, there's a lot of similarities in all the world religions, and of course a lot of American Buddhists are Jews, uh, a disproportionate know, percent why, because of certain why. similarities, but um, th not the majority by any means. So it's just something that I got into when I was in college, and then when I graduated in 1971, I went to India, to the Himalayas, to Tibet, Nepal, and so forth, and a year in Japan in order to trace yoga and meditation to its roots. You talk about the similarities in Judaism. What about Catholicism? You said all the religions basically are very similar, but there's a lot of Catholic Buddhists too, or there's former Catholics. Or there's what a lot of say? hybrids of all kinds. Of course, this is a <laughs> melting pot society, so we have melting pot spirituality. But um, Buddhism has more in common with Judaism than with Catholicism, perhaps. For oh. example, Catholicism has uh, the Trinity and uh, more pictures of God and so on. A Buddhism is like Judaism in having no image of the ultimate. Oh. So Jews find that very uh, doable. And also Judaism isn't so much about a faith and belief as Catholicism, let's just say for the moment. And Buddhism is not about faith and belief at all. But how, what is it about then? It's about enlightenment, how to become enlightened. Buddha was a teacher of ethics, meditation, and wisdom, and uh, nonviolence, and so on. Of course, this is in all the world religions, but he emphasized meditation, mindfulness, awareness, and good deeds, not so much the afterlife, not so much um. faith, not converting people, not proselytizing. Mm -hmm. and so it's, a, it's not really a religion as much as an ethical, psychological philosophy of awakening. Even Einstein, Albert Einstein said that Buddhism seemed like to him like the uh, appropriate religion of the future because it eschews dogma and proselytizing and it's very much in tune with the natural world and natural laws. Well, you can continue your own religion then and be a Buddhist. Of course, many people do. I mean, do. isn't that right? There are, there are Jewish Buddhists, Christian Buddhists, oh. atheists and agnostic Buddhists. If you meditate, if you do yoga, you don't have to convert. You also don't have to believe in religion. You can still get the health, mental and physical health benefits, spiritual benefits, uh, longevity benefits of meditation, yoga, chanting, uh, healthy living, with or without subscribing to any belief system. And I think that's one of the almost unique properties that Buddhism offers us today. As the Dalai Lama says, his 
religion is loving kindness. Religion should be about wisdom and compassion and altruism. He's always stressing altruism and the, the good, innate good heart, the warm heart that we all have inside of us. And that we shouldn't argue so much about theology and where did the world come from and the next life. And, and who's going to lead it, right? And ignore and this the, life right. and ignore what's going on in this world, that we have to take positive action in this world today. You, you talked about the Dalai Lama and you studied with many of his masters, That's peace, right. people who taught him. Yes, also the Dalai Lama. I'm close to the Dalai Lama. Oh, you Lama. St studied with him as well? Yes. And who else did you study with and what kind of classes do you go through? I mean, are they actual classes like like there's college cla classes? There's classes and there's more than classes. There's um, study, there's also practice like silent meditation retreats. There's yoga and fasting. There's chanting and <coughs> ritual training. There's monastic training. So I was a Buddhist monk and lived in a monastery for eight years. So do a you have to go? Monastery. You have to go through all those things to be, you're called Lama. Tell yes, us what Lama is. A Lama is a priest or a meditation master in Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism particularly. Oh. So um, that's a very well-trained, uh, experienced kind of a teacher. But uh, just to be a Buddhist practitioner or get the benefits, you don't necessarily have to go through such a rigorous training. Of course, um, the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. I mean, that's kind of the law of life. But so now as a Lama, d what does that put you in a position to teach? Or do you have a, a center? Or? I have a center. I have centers, the Dzogchen cent Meditation Centers in Cambridge, Massachusetts, ah, in New York, Austin, um, Oregon, San oh, Francisco. So, oh. And I have students, and I write books, and I teach, and I translate the ancient wisdom into the modern world. You write books, and, the, yes. and you've written how many books? So many. Nine books. Nine books. And the newest one is Buddha Is As Buddha Does. And the one thing that I found so interesting about this is you talk about 10 things that people mm -hmm. should know or that they, yeah, that, they can do. that they can do. It's like the Ten Commandments in a way. Well, except it's not it commandments say, that you not. have to do or right. believe in. They're practices to do, such as practice generosity, practice patient forbearance, which is the antidote to anger and hatred, practice mindfulness, which is the antidote to mindless living, which brings all kinds of problems and accidents. So when we practice these things, it transforms our lives and transforms us and it transforms all of our relations, which eventually transforms the whole world because we're all interconnected, if we're all in the same boat together. If you're all doing that at the same time, you talk about a Buddha heart and mm -hmm. does a Buddha heart actually translate into what you were saying? Yes, we all. Ha Buddha said we all have the Buddhist heart or a bodhicitta, the enlightened potential within us, the good heart, the Dalai Lama calls it in English. And this means that underneath it all, we all have that good heart and, you know, maybe we've got defense mechanisms or persona or scars from our life, but underneath it all, I believe we all want to be better people and contribute to a better world. So this is the Buddhist heart. Of course, it's not Buddhist particularly, it's the Buddha heart. It's like oh. the Jesus heart. Buddha heart. The, the other thing is um, people are always having so many problems with their relationships and marriages and I think one of the things that you talk about in the book is how you can make those relationships better. Well, of course, relationship is the essence of life. There's no way around that. Even if you're alone, you're in relationship. The right. hermit in the tarot cards is also part of the deck. And somebody supports oh, the hermit true. and feeds the hermit. Right. So, you know, as there's an old story that one day the mountain hermit uh, heard there was a flood in the, villi in the village in the valley below and all the villagers had to move to another valley. So guess what? The hermit also had to move <laughs> to another mountain because the hermit exists in relation to the village. Oh, so he had to he be had there to with her. Also. He had to ride. I right. see. So it's always yeah. there. It's always there. Saying. And we're always in relation. Even Martin Buber said in his great teachings of I, Thou, of seeing the divine in, in the other, that a life is all about relationship or encounter. Every encounter is a spiritual encounter between oneself and the all. And what is that in? That's what a, kind of teaching? That's in the Jewish teachings. Oh, of that's Martin in the Buber. Jewish teachings. Yes. I see. So, you know the Jewish teachings very well, I'm sure. I don't know the Jewish teachings very well, but I've read these but things. You, but Buddhism, I know. But what about yoga? Tell us what that is, because you talked about studying that. And you talked about Zen. Well, everybody Let's knows. Give us a few. Everybody ideas. knows today what yoga is. Yoga is a healthy way of life, as well as physical exercises. It works on our body, on our energy, on our spirit, and it's a good way to live. And it has a lot of ethics, also, not just the physical part, but simplicity, purity, nonviolence, mm. humility. Uh, concentration or awareness and so forth. So the essence of it all really, uh, according to our Buddhist or so-called enlightened way of thinking is awareness, mindfulness. Rather than living mindlessly and having all kinds of accidents, 
There are really no accidents, but accidents because we're asleep at the wheel, living more mindfully, more awarefully, more consciously, and cultivating mindful awareness, higher consciousness, so that we do know what's going on. We do see things as they are, not as we think they should be. We see them as they are. That's wisdom. That's reality, according to Buddha. So is yoga a part of Buddhism? No, yoga Well, yoga is a part of Buddhism, but yoga comes originally from Hinduism. Okay, so now take me to Zen. Zen's the Japanese Chinese form of oh, Buddhism. And you studied in Japan I, as I well. I lived and studied in Japan I for see. a year. Oh, so is I've it done the, it all. Is but, it the but, same thing, Zen? It has the same background, the skeleton, but it's a little, it's like there's Catholicism and Protestantism, but it's all Jesus' it's all teaching. Oh, I so see. some are more high church or low church, some are more simple or elaborate. But the goal of all schools of Buddhism is enlightenment, that we can become as enlightened as Buddha did. And that's really my message, that if I can do it, Joan, you can do it. Anybody can do it. I'm not the Dalai Lama. I'm not M Martin Luther King or Albert Schweitzer or Mother Teresa. I'm just a Jewish jock from Long Island. But it took you almost 40 years to get here. Well, I'm a slow learner. How long learner. will it take us? Will it take us that long, too? It'll take us all just the right amount of time that we need. <laughs> <laughs> That's, is that it? The right, and the, then you the can start feeling. It takes us the time that we need. It's like, how long will it take you to get healthy once you decide to? Yeah, oh there yeah, are many right. factors. Yeah. But there's no doubt, once you decide to, you can g actually get healthy. You what? can get healthier. Even if you healthier. die of the disease, you could have a spiritual healing, a soul healing, and have peace as you die. One of the things in Buddha is, as Buddha does, is it talks about karma. Can mm -hmm. you, we have three minutes left, can you give three us a little karma stuff? Three minutes <laughs> is enough. We all have heard the word karma, and it's a sitcom joke and, right. and but uh, karma is easily misunderstood it's not fatalism or determinism that things are already scripted it means cause and effect that everything has a cause it's scientific like um, for every action there's a reaction in the laws of motion or something in physics it means cause and effect just like in the bible it says what we sow we shall reap right Similarly, it, what goes around comes around. So positive more or less reproduces positive and negative negative. Of course, life is complex. So there's personal action and personal karma. Yes. But there's also but we collective. we can make that, right? It's we up make to us. That. So it, it depends on the power of the heart and mind, our intentions, our motivations, as well as our actions. If you believe you reap what you sow or if you do something mm. wrong, it's going to come back to you. Yes. Is that, in a way, can you control it then? Well, control is a little extra, as I said, because it, what you can do is live according to the principles and trust that whatever happens will happen. Because there's oh, many okay. different aspects of karma, like bad things happen to good people. I because know, that's not what just, you never want. You wonder why does that because happen? Because no, we haven't properly explained it in the new world. Because there's not just personal karma, there's also <coughs> gender karma. Oh. There's species karma. Oh. There's and American you said a karma. Big it's a big overall, picture. Right. So if if a, if, a, if a peoples like your Armenian is genocided, right? That's not because you or your sister were naughty. Oh, right. It's because of the whole socio-political economic history of the Middle East. True, but then we carry it. That's right. So, so you can so carry it as long as you want, or you can cut it off. Well, we wouldn't say cut it off. You can you can purify <laughs> or karma. Understand it. You can understand it. You can be one with it, so you don't resist I it see. and fight it in the same way. So, and acceptance goes a long way to changing things. Just like instead of trying to change your mate, if you accept your mate, oh, it actually yeah. changes your relationship. Yeah. So when I said cut it off, that was really well, wrong. We think about that was wrong to say that. We think that. about con controlling. You know, nobody's in control of the world, but we all participate. So we yeah. all make our karma. It, karma just means conditioning, to put it psychologically. Uh -huh. Karma means conditioning. So when we can change our, we all know habits are hard to change, but we can change our habits. Even addiction, we can change. People say, oh, he's got bad karma, or there's yeah. a bad aura around him, or well, all those things. People say all kinds of things. I also, know. that he's a bad person, he's a good person. Right. But life is not that black and white, as any thinking adult would know. Well, we learned a lot from you today. Thank you. Same here. It's been <laughs> thank a pleasure. you for being with us, Bless really. And I love. And all. Oh, thank you. And 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 I did love reading the book because it's thank so um, it's so down to earth. I mean, it's That's so easy job. to understand. That's translate your job. It, translate not just the words but the concepts. Make it adaptable for today. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Stay tuned because Carol Wells will be on. Hi, I'm
I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Multi-hyphenate Carol Wells has been in show business for so long, since she was 12 years old. So long. <laughs> she has been an actress, a producer, a writer, a singer, an art gallery owner, and she's uh, been in a lot of film, TV, stage, and commercials. Now, Carol, you've, you've done it all, and you're continuing to produce, but you attended UCLA, USC, you went to the University of Santa Barbara for a writing course, you love opera, you took opera in New York with the great baritone Richard Fredericks, and why didn't you continue opera singing? Because I had four children. You didn't. You know? you, oh, is that when you started studying opera? No, I started studying opera when I was um, eighteen. I sang oh, after you had been in show business for a while. Then. Yes, I always <laughs> sang. I was the church um, soloist oh. with um, Tennessee Ernie Ford. Oh, of course. He was the one that always did the great. Oh. male voices, you know, Strong. and I did the soprano parts. Ah. But I studied seriously after I graduated from high school because I sang Massa de Gloria in the Hollywood Bowl at our high school graduation. Oh, so you already were, yes. were studying it at that time. Did you think you were going to have a future in opera? I don't think that I really was serious enough to be a complete opera singer. I was already in television and I loved doing um, stage shows, you know, the musical say, comedies. Right. But to be an opera <clears throat> singer, you have to be so committed. And it wasn't as much fun after a while as doing other things. How easy was TV for you? Because mostly in the 50s and 60s, that's all you were doing. I mean, yes. every time somebody would turn on the TV, and if they go back now and turn on the TV, they'll see your face. That so was, was that fun. easy for you? Well, it was very easy because I was young. You know, I was only 12, 13, 14, 15. And in those years, a lot of people had... Um, acne and pimples, you know, <laughs> and I was blessed that I didn't have acne, and I think that's why I got so many jobs, is because I just was not in that awkward stage when everybody oh, else was. Oh, and then in the 60s, you did a lot of film. Yes, I did. And you um, did. Tell us the, like, some of the, the things that well, you Well, I made, um, some movies. I was under contract to both Universal and MGM Studios, so, you know, I was doing my television series, National Velvet. Oh, I was and when I didn't do that, then they would put me in a film. But you worked with Hugo Haas, Bud Yorkin, Herbert Ross. I mean, great people. The big ones. I should tell you a story about Herb Ross. I love Herb Ross. I can Ross. tell you now because he's already passed away. I know. But, you know, I was so excited about working with him when he was uh, directing Funny Lady with Barbara Streisand and Omar Sharif and Jimmy Kahn and I'm thinking oh my goodness I'm gonna learn something wonderful from this man I'm just gonna really love it I'm gonna soak it in <laughs> well the first three or four you know weeks on this on the set he ignored me never said a word to me and when I had any scenes with Barbara Streisand he would just kinda like almost I wasn't even there he was so into her Oh. Well, then one was time... Was he worried about how he was treating her? Is that what it was? Oh, Marla? they were treating her with kid gloves. Okay, okay, I see. Because she was very, very difficult. <laughs> I see. And then they gave me this um, wonderful dance number and things to do. And I had a certain mark to make, and I didn't have my eyes LASIK surgery at that <laughs> point, and I couldn't see the mark. So twice I missed it. And here is Herb Ross on top of this big uh, crane like Cecil B. DeMille's, and he's going, Miss Wells, don't you know we have 150 extras on this set, and this is costing us money? And I'm going, I'm sorry, but I can't see. He says, what do you mean? I said, I said well, just get me a cue light. And I screamed <laughs> it at him like that. I mean, I, I did it really loud. I pretended I was Barbara Streisand at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know that after that he was so nice to me? Oh, he recognized Then he you. paid attention to me. <laughs> but it was a terrible way to have to get his, his attention. Well, I'll do, towards the end of your stardom, yes. as a young star, you married a really fabulous oil uh, Sky family, on, oil it. family <laughs> yes, um, I from Los Angeles. And you had two children. And did you stop to raise those children? 
Yes, yes. Oh, you um, did. I, because here you I were, we're talking about. I made the decision, you know, we were married for six years before I became pregnant. And I had a second television oh. series. And then when you decide <laughs> to have a baby, and that little baby is there and depending on you, I don't believe that we as mothers can have children and not give time to it. And so I did stop. Then when my husband died abruptly, I was only 29 years old, oh. then I went back to work again. But all the time you were working and all the time you were married, you were always doing charity work because you got this great humanitarian award. Yes. Who was, what that was, was that for? That was for my work with uh, the group Los Floristas. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. That was a wonderful. They used to do the headdress ball. Yes, and I wish that they would <laughs> televise it. All those huge, wonderful flowers that the fellows that do the rose parade. And y and you were always active in that group. And I they was raised the a lot of money for the children. Was it Children's Hospital? No, or? no. it's for um, the hospital down at Rancho Los Amigos oh, right. and for USC School of Medicine. Oh. But we would, um, you know, go down to the hospital itself and take care of the children and interact with them. So it was a very rewarding that experience. That was great. You also <coughs> have worked in other charities that are very showbiz oriented, like Cher and Thalians. Yes. And I think Las Fl Floristas was as, as No, well. Las Floristas wasn't. In fact, I think I was the only one in um, oh, show business. Right? It was a very, you know, more social wife's most a lot of Pasadena, a lot of SC graduates, <laughs> uh, and it was wonderful because I got to really interact with women that weren't in show business, and they, they were a little oh, more grounded. Oh, I see. They had a whole different viewpoint, I see. and they were so kind. The Las Floristas women saved me through my husband's death, oh. through a horrible. Later, I had a divorce, and I think our girlfriends really do help us the most. Oh, that's great. Well, talking about this and circling this whole thing. You were a Hollywood High alum, and yes. now you are producing, what is it, the 100th anniversary? Yes, we're having <laughs> our 100th anniversary of the Alumni Association. And so, you know, I volunteered. I'm on the board. I'm the curator for their celebrity museum. Well, did you found that museum? No, did I we? didn't. Oh, you no, did? I didn't. Oh, I see. Um, Jimmy, I mean, excuse me, Mrs. Um, Hahn, when was the principal, along with Jerry Anker and oh. some of the other fellows that worked oh, at, I didn't at realize uh, school that. there. Oh, I but they, I took it over when Jerry died. He I passed see. it to me to take care I of. I see. So you've been. So what do you have in a museum like that from Hollywood High? You haven't been there? No. Well, I hope you come to the show next week because we're having a, a wonderful show. But what's in the and museum? And all the pictures of. Well, remember, um, well, Carol Lombard, who I was named after, it was from there. Oh. And we have pictures, memorabilia we have of um, all of the great stars that went there. Lana Turner was the most famous one. Oh. And we have pictures, what if they've written a book. And I what see. I'm going to do is develop from it just being a picture library, going into making it more with all of the um, the computers and having you know oh, all kinds of yes that would be great and you can also probably get costumes and different things that they used in yes, there. Yes, we do have some costumes. Is this in there? Is this in the <laughs> museum? <laughs> do you know I would love to have given it to them. Ray Stark who produced Funny Lady said I could have all my costumes but they took the costumes on tour and they were stolen in South <gasps> Africa. But is this a picture from that? Yes it is. Bob Mackey and Ray oh, Agion wow. made that. Oh. You know what's so funny? Oh. When I was making a movie, Come Blow Your Horn, with um, Frank Sinatra at Paramount Studios, it was in 1962, years ago, and the um, Edith Head was the costumer, and guess who was her, her assistant? Bob Mackey. Oh, he and then years so later, he's now making you know will these this wonderful costumes. Will this picture be in the museum? It's in the museum. Oh, it is in the museum. That's what I want to know. Okay, now you're producing the alumni show. We don't right. have very long to go. So okay. who's going to be in it? Reed Riddle Lee and the fabulous singer Brenda Lee Egger. Um, we have some of the winners from the awards last year that are the students that have now become the alumni. They're also having a show that night, this chorus line, so some of the students are singing from that. But you know, that's very trendy now. Hamilton High, University High, Hollywood High, they're all bringing their alumni back, and many of them have been in show business in one way or another. Well, we have 
I think it's 44 or 45 stars on the Hollywood Boulevard of oh. just our alumni. Is that right? And besides, we have Brandy and Judy Garland. We had Warren Christopher. Oh. Stephanie Powers and I went to school oh, yes, together. Stephanie, right. So we've had a the biggest list of notables from Hollywood area. But getting getting to this show, you're producing it. You're writing it. <laughs> I you're didn't acting know. in it. You're singing. dancing. And this is something for all ladies that are <clears throat> over fifty, as I am. I am tap dancing and <laughs> trying. I think Dancing with the Stars inspired me. So I've started doing dancing again. And doing this show, because we're doing all that jazz from oh, right. from uh, Chicago and a couple other numbers, has helped me get back in shape. But also, I'm doing it to kind of lower your cholesterol and get, you know, healthier. So I, I recommend it. And pole dancing is something Joan and I are going to do oh, together. Yes. But yes, she doesn't yes, want to yes. tell anybody. <laughs> Adria Tanner did that. This actress had a one-person show called Pole, and she did that pole dancing. You it's loved it. It's very difficult. Very difficult. And very sensuous. So before we leave, how did you get through all this producing? I know you're a yoga person. Has that helped you? Yes, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. And I've been doing a lot of Sufi work, which uh -oh. is belly dancing with yoga and Tai Chi together. So, but does all it, of that that, helps. that helps you in your stretching and everything. But what about keeping your mind? I think <laughs> at what rest. you do is you don't need as much sleep. Oh, that's. But the tap dancing has been wearing me out. I can tell you. But yes, I think anything that we could do to give ourselves more clarity with our peace of mind, with either meditation or. Whatever you can do to stay present in the moment is going to help us with any of our stress. And, and for our future. We need to do that. We yes. have to do that. Yes. And it helps you stay young. Well, it keeps you in sync with yourself. Carol, thank you so much for coming and being on the show today. And we want to thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017.